Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gladys Asiedu, who is an associate consultant and an assistant professor of health services research at the Mayo Clinic Center for the Science of Healthcare Delivery. Uh, Dr. Asiedu's research focuses on linking micro and macro factors related to patient health and health systems through engagement with healthcare providers, their context, and the community as interactive partners. Her work also focusing on addressing disparities and inequities in workplace, patient, and community settings, as well as methodological approaches in practice, improvement, and implementation designs. She is one of the core leads for a newly launched diversity science program at Mayo Clinic. So welcome, Dr. Asiedo, and thanks everyone again for joining. And for those of you with questions, please put it in the chat. So without further ado. Thank you so much, Dr. Fleury, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. I know we had planned this a year ago, but um, thankfully with your coordination and Paula's determination, we made it happen. So I really appreciate this. First of all, thank you to the School of Public Health for this invitation. And to you, Dr. Fleury, I know you and I met some uh, last year at EDVM and we kind of started this interaction. I also appreciate um, um, this invitation from the Dean, as well as the um, Graduate School, uh, the Committee for Equity and Inclusion, and most of all, Paulo's um, help in coordinating this effort to make uh, this presentation happen. So thank you. So um, my first question is, how did we get here to talk about equity, inclusion, and diversity, health disparities? We have been having this conversation for a long time, but recently the social unrest and political climate increased the awareness of disparities and of marginalized communities. And these um, have made the issues of inequity, discrimination, racism, and other, um, other um, events around it propelled to the forefront of healthcare and uh, organizations and institutions. We all know that in response to uh, this uh, systemic inequalities, policies, uh, some uh, organizations took up uh, to protest, other uh, to uh, build allyship platforms, other groups protested, there were eruption of individuals and organizations and corporate entities, including uh, our healthcare institutions that responded to these events. And so, um, my um, interest arises from the aspect of health, uh, health disparities and health equity in this space. I am a family scientist by training and uh, have background in human services and healthcare delivery as well. And so I am compelled to comprehend human experiences through the lens of relationships, context and systems. And we all know that individuals are also nested uh, within relationships and organizations as well. And so the communities and the structures um, that uh, people uh, find themselves in also add up and make up their experiences. And all these uh, levels that are interacting, uh, making the context of health equity and making the context of equity, inclusion and diversity very dynamic and very contextual. So organizations are no different, but are, they are also complex entities when it comes to these experiences. And so we, I believe that for effective change to occur, there's a need to at least evaluate change at every system level, including issues related to equity, inclusion, and diversity. I realize that the, these concepts may mean different things for different interest groups and organizations, but today I'm going to focus on some of the efforts that are impacting Mayo Clinic or uh, the work that I, I am doing at Mayo Clinic in the EID space within this institution. And Mayo Clinic and how the data that we are gathering is being utilized in different ways. So thank you. So um, throughout this presentation, I am hoping to highlight the need and the importance of institutional data for the case of the EID work. I'm also hoping to share um, data spaces that are impacting EID efforts as I earlier on alluded to, and hopefully that will be helpful in your institutional efforts as well. 
but I, or most of all, I will also um, challenge us and our institutions to move from cosmetic victories, which is the need to collect more data and more data to rather uh, move to action focused efforts. Because most of all, uh, challenge us about EID spaces, the concepts and strategies and aid solutions. Also in this presentation, I may be giving an example from a health equity uh, perspective or equity in general and inclusion spaces. I do not mean to interpret these constructs as the same, but they are all, they all because they all have different meanings. But if we think about a health equity as a goal of helping each person attain their highest level, we also think of EID as focused, uh, uh, focused efforts to meet each person where they are by appreciating their uniqueness. And, and therefore, these uh, the EID initiatives can be um, instrumental in increasing health equity. So if I'm using examples in both spaces, pardon me, I do not mean uh, for them to be the same, but I, I believe that um, one informed the other, and so it's the uh, reverse. So for example, a health equity dashboard may include measures to include race, ethnicity, the language preference and cultural competence training. A diverse staff also helps patients from underrepresented backgrounds to feel more comfortable during their stay in hospital in our institution, for example. And then diversity and inclusion directly impact patients' uh, health outcomes and quality of life. So these concepts are related in one way or the other. So I do not have any disclosures um, for this presentation. Um, all the information, in fact, most of the information that I will be presenting are confidential, but some of them are data platforms that we have begun to incorporate within our institution in the efforts of uh, EID work. And so I would uh, appreciate it this, if this presentation is not distributed outside of uh, your institution, but even so, if it's distributed, I'm hoping that it will be for educational purposes. So thank you for that. All right, so how did I get here? I mean, literally, how did I get into this space? I am originally from Ghana. I grew up in Ghana and um, back in Accra where uh, I, I grew up in Accra where I lived in a small town around uh, Accra called Iburi Mountains. Growing up in the 70s was an era where there were national initiatives and emphasis on girls education at the, at the time to curb the cycle of teenage pregnancy. Ghana, as uh, some of you may know, is a patrilineal society and historically women's place is less valued in education, but are entrenched in tradition and bounded by circumstances surrounding birth, marriage, and childbirth and, 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 and uh, household work. So my dad, I grew up, my dad was a big proponent of girls' education. And so he was an inspiration in my life growing up. My younger, my younger sister and I grew up with him in all our high school years. Uh, but generally, as a young girl growing up in a male-dominated society, I had to learn to prove myself, fight for what I believe in my opinion belongs to me and uh, my right, and I got the full support of my dad. I, there were instances I recall in elementary school where I used to be on top of the class, and then with time, uh, that position was taken away from me because my grades were swapped or changed for the for, for the for the boys in the class so that they can be also on top. So really I started um, the journey of inequities uh, right from elementary school and then in my in my country, like I said, since there were different cultural norms and things like that. As a woman, it is very difficult for you to be on top of everything else. And I got really interested in, the, in, in those issues and how I can help and also empower other women, other girls uh, uh, um, in, in those areas. So there were times that I would have small, uh, small groups uh, with my friends. We visit uh, different institutions to talk about the empowerment of girls. I had the privilege of attending an all girls high school and that really helped us to, to, to make those strides as well. When I moved 
to um, the United States, I originally moved to Kansas. Uh, I had where I had my graduate school, uh, both masters and PhD in a certification, graduate certification in women's studies. I recognized the privilege to be myself as a woman, but also noted that the challenges are somehow similar and yet different as a black woman, as an immigrant, different cultures on a different visa and navigating all those dynamics. Um, funny uh, story that I will tell. I remember one time I was in an elevator and um, a gentleman came to the elevator and said, hello, I responded back. And all I heard was him saying something which I did not really understand. So when I got, it was when I got out of the elevator that I, I understood what he said. And what he said was nice weather we are having. Well, it took me a, a, a second to catch that because where I came from, we don't talk about the weather. In fact, there are only two seasons. It's either dry season or wet season. And, and the weather is almost always the same. So that and many other situations I had to navigate shape my life as a woman, as a black woman, as an immigrant and a person with English as a second language. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is that my experiences growing up in a, patri a patriarchal society have, uh, have helped me to come to understand the importance and the impact of inequity, racism, tribalism, and discrimination. But of course, my move to the United States and working at Mayo Clinic gave me different contexts and perspectives and the framing of racial inequity, especially in a different way, which has brought me here today. So, um, Anyway, I will continue and I do not want to make this presentation about me, but I always like to start my presentation with who I am and how I came to be who I am and why I am interested in the things that I do and the research that I do over here at Mayo Clinic. So I continue to do this work and be passionate about issues pertaining to my identity, gender and women's issue, especially women's health, and that landed me at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. So the doors of Mayo opened great opportunities and also some wounds that created opportunities to channel some of my energy, in this case, research into issues of health equity, diversity and inclusion efforts. So I am showing on your screen a, um, a statement that was put in my annual appraisal uh, years back, I remember, one of my first few years as an analyst following a postdoc fellowship. These words were feedback from my first annual uh, performance appraisal when I started work with the Ken Center at Media. At first, I didn't think anything of it and didn't believe a colleague had just asked me to change my accent. The person said, Ruth, I encourage Gladys to be mindful of her pronunciation and communication. You didn't think anything of it. I mean, I've, I've had these and many other, other things throughout my life, but the action that followed stayed with me. My supervisor was uh, referred uh, me to a speech modification agency to improve upon my accent and to attain a more refined American accent. And like I said, I did not read any meaning into this statement when I saw it first that it wasn't about my accent, I had different ideas. But the impact of the words and actions following it perhaps mattered to me more than the intent. So it is, as you can tell, it is easy to hurt others without being cautious about what we say of those whose experiences are different than ours. It is, this is true, especially in the context of our clinic, Mayo Clinic, which opens its doors to employees, patients from around the world. When your colleagues express dismay at your inability to pronounce things the way they do, it brings your attention to that person, your work environment, the institution, and further magnifies how different you are in those spaces that can be quite isolated. That was my aha moment. I spent a lot of time, uh, most days, asking questions about this experience. And then to uh, top it up with uh, during the COVID, um, we were all deployed in different centers to help, you know, with the telemedicine, uh, uh, Zoom patients, uh, virtual visits thing. And so I was redeployed to a different work unit. 
I responded to a call from a patient and he expressed frustration with the technology of using Zoom to do his patient uh, visits and, and, and with a physician. I assured that gentleman that I can assist him with a Zoom setup to connect to the provider. I explained the steps to them. We went through the steps one, two, and no problem. And then the third uh, step, which was the final step that I was going to help him. Then moving on to the final step, he asked if he could speak, uh, if I could speak slowly so he could, he could understand. I said, no problem. I did try to speak slowly. Before I could say anything, the next thing I heard him chuckle was, I will call back later to talk to someone who speaks. English and the call dropped. I took a deep breath, distraught, distracted, appalled, you name it, locked off my workstation, spent most of the day thinking of the event. I reported the incident to the supervisors that I was working with on that team. Again, the junior super member of the team responded that he will contact, will have contact with the senior supervisors and get back to me. End of story. Between these two um, incidents, I called HR. Unfortunately, the HR system could not help me in any way. I stood on the phone with a supervisor who was going through the database to find anything at all on, uh, on how they can help me throughout this process. But I would like us to look at the layers of these two stories. And again, it is not about me. I am just a single story. There are many stories, but they have little to do with me because they are systems that perpetuate and fertilizes those experiences. And I would like our focus to be on those systems and not me as an individual. If we look at, uh, if we look at these stories, the context, the intersectionality, my experiences as a woman, as a black woman, as an immigrant, as someone who does not speak English the way other Americans speak. I mean, there are different things that will be going on in my head or however I experience these experience, negative experiences. But the reality is these experiences are labeled as negative experience versus the reality of our experience. It is the reality of our experience, but they are labeled. And then you look at the impact of these microaggression, cognitive intrusion, psychological fatigue, decrease in productivity and time waste. I spend an awful amount of time thinking about these uh, experiences. And I know most people do too. We spend so much time wasted thinking about it. Uh, what should I have said something? Is it me? You know, those types of questions. And then we talk of equality and equity as evident in my stories, diversity in employee needs, right? There aren't much diversity in employee needs. And so the expectation is just one expectation that has been laid from whoever speaks, however they want to speak and that, that is it. And then we look at it, at, at it from a systemic issue too. There are independent behaviors that are actually linked to a broader systemic issues. So, um, Individuals will behave the way they would behave in many ways. But as systems are put in place to keep those behaviors, I think that would be very, very helpful. In my case, in both two instances, my supervisor couldn't help me. In fact, they made it even worse. Both supervisors from the two job uh, sites could not help me. The HR system could not help me. And so um, what happens then is that these experiences are defined in legal compliance and they are all entangled in law and laws. And so if an episode or if an event does not rise to the level of uh, maybe comply, be it being compliance or legal issues, then it is ignored. But so I think the solutions must come from the system. So personal experiences happen in larger contexts. We all know that in larger contexts, schools, hospitals, our organizations. And these findings are interpreted using the conceptual model as I have laid out here. I use that a lot in most of my presentation that a person's um, experience may be as a result of systemic issues that has been built on over the years and over the years. The experiences of microaggressions are made up, which are made up of micro insults or micro assaults, 
hard to, it, it is very hard to detect invisible and sometimes they are uh, dismissible. And so a general stereotyping behaviors from other colleagues can be very devastating. These are individual experiences, as I have said, but they are defined by misidentification and stereotype within institutional uh, systems and sometimes institutional policies themselves. And so I would um, like to, um, I wanted to talk a bit more about this system, but um, we, we had some data that looked at this, uh, specific um, issues within the personal level. And we found so many experiences that are related to patients and colleagues, and uh, but also happens because of the interactions that goes uh, within the institutional entities. And also, if we look at the hiring and job assignment and promotion criteria, oh my goodness, there are so many things that needed, needs to be done. Uh, there are so many uh, of our data, our internal data shows that many um, minority groups are willing to come here, but most of them don't last on the job for more than two to three years and they leave. But we also find out that the mission, the mission of Mayo Clinic uh, versus the reality of what employees are facing. So you have top um, top administrative level people who makes comments, derogatory comments that questions the actual mission and value of, of Mayo Clinic of respect for everyone, irrespective of their diverse background. So I, I again, I said, this is not about me. I am one, uh, maybe some percent that is lost in the system. But I do believe that there's always an avenue to have discussion and there's always an avenue to have um, a solution focused um, activities and initiatives within the organization. So I channeled my experiences into finding ways to effect meaningful change in the work that I do, uh, be it in patient workforce or community context. So back in 2019, we formed uh, an um, inclusion and diversity work group within our department, which was called the KIND group. And um, we kind of got started talking about these issues and creating awareness within our institution. And the more I talk, I, we talk about it, the more I realized that there are so many people within this institution who have, who experience in their day-to-day -day work, who experience so many negative experiences that has not, been um, regarded or acknowledged. And so if you think about it, Mayo Clinic is a, 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 has a workforce over 70,000 across the enterprise. And <clears throat> especially for the Rochester campus, um, there are a few of us who are, who are black and brown um, employees. And so these issues are really uh, important. So we kind of put together a work group and came up with proposal to do something that uh, our organization has never thought of before, which is create a platform, a data platform um, that would um, enable all employees, black and brown employees to go there and anonymously share their experiences. Um, and when we were creating the platform, it was more coming from our passion and our, I mean, our, our interest in the work of this space and wanting to have the attention of uh, the leaders and the administrative leaders of Mayo Clinic more so than anything else. So we created the platform and um, because we also found that there's a need for capturing and highlighting those voices other than what we hear every day in our work or outside of our workplace. So, um, but we also wanted to use the platform to build awareness and empathy and to provide a repository of experiences that will allow us to create impactful and sustainable actions based on data for eliminating racism at the time. That was around the time of Judge Floyd's murder. So, so to sum up, the Get Your Platform Mayo Clinic was to understand our current state and guide us to our future state. As we continue to collect stories, we, we have created other sub uh, components of the, of the uh, platform. We have an allyship platform now. We have other, uh, other components like LGBTQ experiences. We have disability experiences and hoping to expand on that in the future. 
And so the way we went about it is, again, as I alluded uh, uh, earlier on, these experiences are most often entangled by compliance and uh, legal and you know HR and what needs to be reported, what is, needs not to be reported. So we set up to build a multidisciplinary approach to address these. So <clears throat> we presentations of this uh, initi uh, initiative rallied support from institutional leadership and departments and units. And we developed uh, a representation of, uh, of the platform, how it's going to look like, and we shared it with them. So the platform components uh, were made up of IT representative, HR, uh, compliance office, uh, representative legal uh, representative and other departments and volunteers who were interested. So we included terms of use, uh, story submission, a browse, uh, browsing of stories and contact of, for resources and all that. So the terms of use acknowledge the employee's uh, role that wants them not sharing the content outside of the organization. This was all through via our intranet and it provided the institutional resources for reporting incidents. But we also created a moderating system where if there are questions about a particular story, especially if it's gone, if it's been reported to the compliance hotline, we will not deal with it, but have that uh, um, kind of uh, moved over to compliance or HR to deal with it. So we set that up and then we work with designers and we work with um, other volunteers from our department, scientists and data collectors uh, to form this platform. And then it, it, it really expanded. Uh, so I think last year we had over 200 stories, unique stories shared on, on the platform. So what we did was we were observing uh, traffic, trafficking on the website, how, what people were looking for, how they're responding to things. And then we analyzed the data and then came up with um, some reports or some recommendations, which uh, we created a scorecard out of it. So um, as a qualitative researcher, my interests lie in understanding people's experiences and making sense of, of it. And sometimes these experiences are hard and difficult to hear. We've had difficult conversations with our leaders, especially in the EID spaces. Sometimes the data we gather may not be sweet music to the ears. But we also know that in order to be the light and share the light, we have to understand the darkness. And so we can all bring positive change only if we understand the challenges that is ahead of us. So what did we do? We embarked on a journey to collect all this data, put them together. The concept of crowdsourcing is what we use. And we think that concept actually promoted inclusion and the democracy in, in the way that we recruited people to be on the site. And so, like I said, over 200 stories were collected between um, when we set the uh, platform up back in uh, July up until the end of the year. And so we, after that, we compiled a confidential report documenting these experiences and we submitted it to the CEO, all the uh, mayor uh, enterprise leaders. And then in that report, we provided a compilation of the stories that highlighted recurring themes of racism, bias, inequities, um, and insights into the organization's culture from the point of view of black and uh, uh, black and African American employees. And some action-oriented recommendations for improving the workplace experiences and environment for this group of people. So at the end, what did we find? So um, we all know that, um, and as I had alluded to racism and discrimination and some of these inequities are systemic issues and they expand from individual experiences or from the micro level to a more broader cultural and macro system where individuals display a lack of trust in the systems that are meant to be working for them. So I also want to emphasize that as overwhelming as the stories or the data shows, our institution vulnerability has been very instrumental and has been the days on which the, this creativity was enhanced. Otherwise we, we, we wouldn't have gotten uh, to where we are today. So we really appreciate that support. 
So the get real reports that we created really, so we summarized it into four big uh, categories that minorities within the institution want their voices heard and they want solutions. And then the traditional approaches to diversity issues is quite limiting because they feel that it is not working. There are um, urgent solutions that needed and outcome metrics that needed to be uh, uh, attended to. And uh, most of all, we also believe that what we find, found in that, in that report also indicated that national data is, uh, is good, but internal data captures uh, our own experiences, the nuances, the context, and, and, and are par paramount to eradicating the inequities that are within our system. So institutional narrative can provide insight about how the organizations, organization's culture is shifting over time, we believe, and what factors may be contributing to those changes. And the get job provided a view um, to, to some of these issues. So the report and findings also provided us with opportunities to enhance and strengthen our EID, our HR compliance system and to hold ourselves accountable with the work that we're doing in those spaces as well. So um, this is just a sum of what uh, the Get Your uh, platform is offering. So it's, it's typically a crowdsourced informed accountability and those, uh, 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 moves up or springs up other priorities and initiatives within the institution. And then we form incubator programs through that, that gets circled back to address, uh, to uh, kind of address some of the issues we find which uh, comes in the scorecard. And then that also serves as an accountability to the organization as well. So these action-oriented recommendations were presented in an easy to review scorecard format as they were deemed imperative for minimizing the inequities. So, so that um, managers, supervisors, and leaders could use it in a way that would be befitting to their departmental needs. And so we used the scorecards to inform, initially when we started to inform anti-racism initiatives that assisted in creating safe and supportive environment for, 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 for all employees. With this framework, we also know that Mayo is expanding its effort to address inequities in other areas. For instance, I am now working with pharmacy, um, uh, with pharmacy departments to create uh, some kind of um, toolkits for the hiring managers because the, we did another study, initial study that showed that there are so many biases in the recruitment processes that needs to be attended. And in fact, not only in pharmacy, we're hoping to kind of uh, start with pharmacy and then expand those uh, toolkits into other departments as well. So when it comes to uh, how GetGirl is Im impacting uh, the Mayo Clinic environment, we believe that uh, throughout this process, there has been personal learning and transformation uh, throughout this processes. Um, uh, some people would, some people said, this made me believe the experiences more, it transformed the perspective of diversity and inclusion issues and challenges that we're facing. We also, out of that, have built a scientific program, which I am one of the leads in that program, diversity science program. It's a work group that is transforming the science of diversity in our institution. We're also uh, building this as a framework for implementing other isms, uh, which has been adapted, like I said, by uh, pharmacy. And, and we also have other departments like emergency department asking about the using of the platform and how to. Out of this, we have other, uh, other things that I will discuss further, but it's also, uh, it also has given us the opportunity to have actual talk, real talk, about some of these experiences in our in, in, in the open and, and actually find a space for it in our institutions and also have more strategic and uh, authentic collaborators in this space. So as I said before, uh, one of the main things that came out of this uh, project is for us to build 
a uh, diversity science uh, program within our department to kind of reimagine our approaches and assess our approaches to equity, inclusion, and diversity at Mayo. So we launched this back uh, in March uh, 2022, which is a year ago. And our effort is mainly focused on facilitating scientific rigor, the use of data to assist with implementing and integrated solutions and examine outcomes within our institutions in the patient space, in community space, and in a workforce space. And also uh, uh, use, uh, find ways to create knowledge hub to support EID infrastructure. So following the establishment of the diversity science program, we also I mean, felt the pressure to make a case for the case of uh, equity, inclusion, and diversity. If, if you have been in this space, you notice that there's always questions that it's been asked. Okay, what is the business case? Can we make a case for it? Because it is the making of the business case that gets you funded, right? That gets you the attention within the clinic. And that is a huge roadblock for us because there's so many things that cannot be quantified in ways that uh, we would think of in, in actual or conventional research way. So there's nothing wrong with it, uh, given a business case. Of course, the survival of any institution and any organization is a business aspect of it. So there's nothing wrong with it. But I think there needs to be more considerations uh, if this effort needs to uh, move forward and do things outside of our conventional ways. I think there's more uh, that needs to be done of it. So. The case for diversity and equity inclusion, uh, we were asked several um, spaces to uh, kind of uh, make our own case in, in, in this and, and the get to your platform uh, of uh, give us opportunity that cannot be provided solely by general uh, guarantees of, uh, of, of this. And so, and, and then when you look at uh, the space, Apart from making the business case, there are other concepts that are, are that are coming up. You think of the concept of belonging, the concept of workplace justice, which are also uh, being included in in in, in this EID space. These are essential, uh, if I would say, they're very essential. But uh, sometimes the addition of these uh, other concepts makes it difficult to move forward because you, we are always looking for uh, a uniform or a standard way to address all these equities in, in, in a shot. And sometimes that creates, um, uh, um, uh, uh, that does not specifically address the needs and then we, we, we come back to uh, square one. And so uh, you have issues like that, are, that comes up like affirmative action how do we give spots to people of color when other people with, uh, who are equally qualified do not get spaces? You have all these concepts that are. So you, you, you think of this, like I said, now it comes to the issue that we are entering into this era of the sense of belonging and then the workplace. It's all for the common good, but let's take a moment to think about how the expansion of these concepts and strategies impact the data that we gather are they targeted, broad, specific, general, and do we meet our goals in those outcomes? Again, I'm not an expert in this area, but we have to challenge ourselves and institutions to think about these, concept, con these concepts within our own house and within our own institution. And this uh, kind of concept in this conversation actually makes me think of, when you think of the health disparity space and the, histo the history that has gone on into that space. I mean, we go down history a bit and we will notice this is not new. The area of health disparities have had its share of that history. Now it is a buzzword because everybody is, stri is striving to uh, put it as priority in its organizational um, missions. But historically, we know African American and Native Americans have received the least desirable outcomes. And you think of uh, the late 1800s when W.E.B. Du Bois documented the health of the Black community in, in, in the book, in his book, The Philadelphia Negro, noting how Blacks live in healthy circumstances over, uh, compared, to, uh, compared to whites. 
you think about uh, Booker T, 1900, who during a National Negro Conference compiled facts about the same experiences, then that sprang up act activism, then that sprang up uh, uh, and civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King, nothing happened. Then there was the introduction of health services as an academic discipline in the mid 1900 uh, by health economics. And finally that attracted some scientists and all that. And, and you, you think about these concepts and what happens to it, what gets added to it, and several reports with similar findings came out during the Reagan administration, for instance, the first convening of a group of health experts by the US government to conduct comprehensive study of racial and ethnic minority health that went on. And then other political leaders followed suit and then 1990, the Agency of Healthcare Research and, uh, uh, and Quality was tasked to research and publish annual reports. The Act of 2000 uh, that was also created that what is today's National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Then Congress directed the Institute of uh, Medicine to assess differences in kinds of quality. So you see, when I think about these issues, I think about it in this way that we are always loading we are always loading in this space and not moving forward to what we need to do. We get so much entangled with so many things that it's difficult for us to focus on a particular concept and a construct to find solutions and to find actions that uh, could minimize uh, some experiences. So like I said, we're doing the same and I believe we're still uh, loading at this page and it's for many of us and you perhaps even institutions, it can be daunting and challenging. And what I have seen is institutions crumble to do the same while um, uh, this page is loading, we keep adding things. But I'm, I'm just trying to be a little real because it can be really challenging as, as a scientist in this space. And you get asked so many questions and you get, to do so many things and yet you don't get to where you need to be. So I would challenge us to think about these concepts in the way that are that befits our institutions that and also what we want to focus on and what is relevant to our institutions so that we can move forward. People that have interacted with me and know me uh, ask me so many questions and I'm always eager to move from what I call diversity one to diversity two, which is moving from these small cosmetic victories of gathering data to actually um, uh, are doing something with the data that we have. And so that's my objective and that's what I do within these spaces. So more about the business case for uh, uh, health equity and uh, uh, not necessarily health equity, but equity and inclusion and diversity. And we, we get into data-driven business cases for people working in EID spaces to make a case using data, both institutional and national to justify the work. But let's think about it. We promote such values as innovation, resilience, integrity, without even explaining it. We don't have to explain it. When it comes to diversity, lengthy justification, at least I have experienced that in my own institution for one project that I have to, not one project, many of the projects that we had to do justify the practice, in fact, justify this, justify that, of the value of hiring a diverse populate workforce have become a standard in, in workplaces, which is also quite disturbing in my uh, perspective. Most of Fender's business case is based on dollars and cents. And so if it's not yielding back, the dollars and cents, then that is not relevant. And, and, and now in my own space, we're getting into the space of, oh, okay, now we're not going to fund uh, efforts on EID projects. We're going to fund, fund EID projects, but not efforts, full-time effort. Well, how are we going to get the work done? And is there an ideal project that is designed that does not have a person's effort on it? No. I don't think so. We need people to do the work. We need people to move forward and do the work in this space. And so the assertion that we can do the work with our efforts, uh, funding of efforts is ridiculous in my opinion, but 
more on the business case. Uh, many organizations explain their interest in diversity by making some form of business case. Many departments require business cases. The bottom line is justifying diversity in workplace on the grounds that it benefits the company. So in a recent uh, study, uh, the, uh, these two authors, they, they are be, uh, organizational behavior uh, scientists found that approximately 80% of organizations use the business case to justify the importance of diversity uh, compared to the case for fairness, which uses less than uh, 5%. And so the, the remainder of the people in the study did not list diversity as a value or did so without providing any justification for why it mattered to the organization. So clearly, despite the positive intentions, making the business case for diversity does not appear to be the best way to attract underrepresented uh, job candidates as uh, who, I mean, especially those who read a business case for diversity on average anticipated that only 11% less, uh, had less sense of belonging to the company where 16% more concerned that they would be stereotyped at the company and where 10% where more concerned that the company would view them as interchangeable with other members of the identity group compared to those who read a fairness case. So when you read a fairness case, it's more likely that they will be willing to uh, work in those organizations. So this approach actually makes minority candidates a lot less interested in working within the organization, making the business case that is. So the quest to make our business case for diversity sends a subtle yet impactful signal that organizations view employees from underrepresented groups as a means to an end, which could potentially undermine EID efforts uh, and have employers even had the chance to interact with potential employees. So these authors who are, like I said, organizational behavior experts suggest that if organizations must justify their commitment to diversity, they should do so by making fairness case. That is an argument based in moral grounds. And we all know that this moral grounds does not stand the test of legal and compliance issues. So it brings us to square one. Nonetheless, um, there are um, efforts in these spaces that are making strides and I will share with you some of the data that we are, the data platform that we're using to make some of these uh, differences in our organization that I'm leading. So um, making a case for diversity when the moral judgments or argument implies that value and diversity is up for discussion. So remember that we don't have to explain why we value innovation, resilience, or integrity. So why treat diversity any different? They may not meet the, uh, these uh, efforts and initiatives may not meet the legal threshold to be investigated or solved. Therefore, the edge and strategies with institution-based data-driven solutions and outcome metrics are very necessary to improve this um, concept. So again, what does EID data have to do with it? You look at more than, uh, it, it's been studied that more than 70% of business leaders have said that increasing diversity and inclusion is a top business priority. And it's true, most organizations are striving to do that, but it is data that tells leaders what is working and where they need to take action. But that data needs to move from just gathering the data and uh, gathering the circumstances and the challenges and the experiences to actual, action-driven um, efforts, I think. So how do we uh, focus on uh, utilizing uh, and optimizing the data that we gather from EID data? So collecting um, data and diversity data is not enough alone. As I said, we need analysis, we need uh, actions that move uh, these data into practice in our diversity data data that shows that uh, certain groups are not accessing healthcare at Mayo, or uh, if our staff are not entering or moving through the recruitment funnel as we should, we've had questions about it. Why is that happening? Why does it matter? What can we do about it? These are genuine questions. Uh, how, why should we, how, why are we hiring people and yet within two or three years they leave? Why are we, uh, um, 
posting jobs and the people, the minority people that apply for it are not getting it? Are there things that we need to, to do? Are there pipelines and pathway programs that we need to build to, to fund out those uh, needs? And so um, we partner with skilled uh, scientists throughout the organization, the enterprise who know best how to examine this data and dynamics and the relevance of it. Be also guided by a spirit of inquiry and transparency. Transparency is a key, as I will share in my following slides, and be willing to ask the tough questions. Um, and you, you can't address what you don't identify as a challenge. If the institution does not see this as a problem, then this, we're not going to get anywhere um, in, in resolving this. So some of the tough questions that I need, we, we consider in, in, in doing this work that we do over here at Mayo is, I mean, these are questions that we pose to ourselves every day. I don't have an answer to this, but they are all of us. They are all for us to think about it. And we do try to think through this while we are uh, uh, striving forward in our initiative as well. What does it mean to use evidence and data to improve uh, our EID spaces? How do we measure system improvement? How do we engage people in this, uh, in this improvement uh, up, uh, opportunities? How do we sustain and maintain it? How do we ensure systemic approach so that it is, uh, it is experienced or it is a system-wide uh, approach and not an individual approach in a small department that can be trampled upon by an HR or a supervisor? So engaging communities and relationships among our organization is, is always an optimum to what we do. Uh, research shows few interventions are multi-layered, and so we try to uh, uh, work around interventions that are multi-layered and so address individual issues, but also take up the systemic issues around HR and around uh, compliance and recruitment initiatives within our organization. And so we look at workforce, patients, and, and community to address most of these things. And one of the things that, uh, that has uh, come up from this Get to uh, initiative and other things that we're doing is a dashboard, uh, a data dashboard that will actually, as a live, uh, real-time uh, live dashboard that shows uh, for our workforce, uh, it has become an integral part of our diversity and science program, is updated on a daily basis, and uh, it's provide insight to with respect to performance regarding recruitment, retention, career progression, pay equity, and other things that we have outlined in our diversity and, uh, and inclusion goals and initiatives. So as you can see here, we have the goals. And so from time to time, we're, trying, we're striving to uh, see how we're faring. These are numerical and statistics, but there are other nuances such as building a culture around uh, 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 these uh, numbers that we're also striving to work on. Having access to this real-time data also allow us researchers and practitioners the ability to effectively intentionally track our institutional progress. And then the, the fact that it's real-time also helps us um, to, uh, to see what is happening uh, on a daily or however you want to pull the data. So it was built in collaboration with the Center for Digital Health and our program to use a robust analysis and evaluation springboard by the institution so that we can see what is cosmetic victories and what is actually integrated solutions within uh, these systems. The same thing here, we strive to see employee distribution by peer grade. This is, as at this time, this is only available to supervisors and, and, and the diversity science team. We're trying to build some uh, work, we're trying to do some work around it so that it can be publishable to uh, employees and but also be mindful of what information needs to be shared publicly and transparently to these groups of people. The other thing that uh, we're also striving to work on is scorecards that came out from the Get Your Reports. And so uh, each department adapts uh, what is necessary for it and works through it and have uh, make sure that the scorecard fits their departmental needs. Um, 
so that it's focused on specific process measures for recruitment and retention. There are clear guidelines are provided in terms of scoring and, 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 and points in the system. A detailed free, uh, frequently asked question document was also developed uh, to be a resource to guide the uh, scoring items as well. And we also created a, a, a repository which has all, almost uh, all EID projects and programs that are going on in our institution. It is more for uh, collaboration purposes. It allows individuals from different departments across multiple sites to enter and review this initiative and to partner and collaborate when necessary so that we are not reinventing the wheels all the time. And because there's a lot of repetitive work that is going on, everybody is in their own bubble doing the same thing. And we all think we're, we're doing unique things, but when you collaborate, you see that, oh, other people are doing the same thing. So the inventory will facilitate monitoring of effectiveness of key projects and evaluation tactics within our organization. And so we come to uh, the point of patient diversity. How diverse should our patient population be? These are uh, questions that we ask, but before we go on to that patient population, I mean, in a perfect world, we would see health equity, we would want to use health equity lens for all our workforce processes. Our workforce access to data, uh, data dashboard will be transparent as, as, as our, and we also hope so for our patient population as well. And um, so I, I think the field has gone, uh, has done a lot of good work to explore representation in, card, in regard to our workforce. We have not done a good job increasing diversity, but we think we have a good idea of where we should be. And I believe that less work has been done to determine the targets for patient diversity. What should our patient population look like? And over time, we're working on that with using different strategies, different methodological approaches. I use mostly uh, community-based participatory approach. I use visual qualitative research approach in, in my work uh, just so to capture populations that are oftentimes left out in, in, in the area of research and in uh, health equity spaces. So we identify the percentages of patients that come to the clinic and catchment area uh, using the National uh, Cancer Institute catchment area definitions. We also use a blended approach based on percentage of patients in the catchment area and the percentage of patients um, from outside. Since we are an enterprise, our campuses in Florida and Arizona are doing a great job uh, of uh, hiring, especially with the Native American and African American study coordinators in terms of uh, clinical trial participation, recruitment, and, 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 and all that. They used not to be uh, uh, intentional efforts in those spaces, but now they are intentional efforts in those spaces to increase diversity. So the, diver the diversity science is still in its infancy. Uh, there are not many best practices for this field. I'm a researcher and, and I've been in this space for a while, but I still think there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, workforce diversity dashboard, as I described, is a huge uh, win for us. We are also trying to focus on health equity dashboard, which will mostly focus on, on patients and to target patient diversity and how we can achieve that. Our first step was to determine what we needed to measure and examine to advance health equity so that, so we tend to the literature and then we use the literature and engage our stakeholders to create a dashboard to identify disparities across Mayo and evaluate our strategies and initiatives. So the dashboard will also be an opportunity for departments to compare themselves as far as patient diversity and hopefully spark some engagement from our clinical practice as well. So we think of this health equity dashboard include, they include three main things, care access, screening and outcomes and social determinants of health. We will be able to stratify many of these uh, measured by patient demographics, including race, uh, gender, number of SDOH indicators, uh, that's social determinants of health indicators, primary language. And we, we have tried to incorporate uh, some indicators of SDOH into our uh, patient portal and, and for them to fill out before they come into the clinic. So we try to engage leaders across the clinic to review these measures 
uh, used in the dashboard to make sure we were not missing anything for these processes. So um, using data to reduce health disparities, it speaks to the same aspect of analyzing our health inequity uh, uh, aspects of data uh, to identify these health differences between population groups. And so um, we are using this uh, health equity dashboard, we hope would uh, bring us to where we need to be and where we need to, uh, to go into, or at least, improve or move a needle in that space. So we're looking at access, screening outcomes, and then the social determinant of health as well. And so we we kind of in, in using the same uh, uh, mindset as we do in, in, in the uh, workforce setting. So we're trying to improve access and expansion of telehealth. We're partnering with safety net hospitals and, and community uh, uh, community uh, uh, groups. I have been part of the Rochester Healthy Community Partnership, uh, which is an initiate, a program that uh, help uh, immigrants and refugees access uh, health, but also build research agenda and intervention agenda within its community. I've been working with this group for 12 years uh, for research and intervention uh, purposes. And then I'm also involved with uh, African American uh, faith group, which is kind of the same concepts uh, using community uh, and engaged approaches to reach the African American population within southeastern of uh, southeast uh, area uh, catchment area of Minnesota as well. So, in a perfect world, health. We would all use health equity lens for all processes, patient portal in multiple languages regarding this patient aspect, equity measures and quality reporting, advocating for the regulatory requirements and addressing upstream factors. So how do we improve from here? So to sum up, it is important that we remain vigilant and committed to protecting the vulnerability of those numerical minorities and others with less positive experiences in our workplace and their experiences are very important as well. So we also don't want to stockpile data for data sake, instead use EID data to inform action and to bring some change to our organization. We know that we can develop this in such that we desire for more and more data analysis because that's what we do as researchers. Uh, we build analysis, paralysis, improve it again, tendencies which to real change and actually brings us back to looking at all these new concepts again and again and again and then we end up uh, being in the same place so data should be used to drive strategic planning but should also be considered part of planning orientation for discovery documentation and mostly interventions and so what is the end game results should be publicly available as we have done with the dashboard uh, and our repository and then uh, the other initiatives that we have. We want to increase representation, but we also want to build inclusion and ensure equity in those spaces. So in conclusion, it's okay to show that there's work to be done. We also know that individuals are living in states of affairs. They don't need data to validate the experiences. Ex experiences has been documented over and over. They know what's working and what's not. We need to engage them in, in building these platforms and in building these community approaches that bring solutions and actual uh, improvement. So showing the data does not create friction as uh, some people, it, sometimes it's not comfortable, but if that's how we're going to get there, we should uh, engage in those. What data does is to create trust uh, from transparency and foster belief that organization is ready to move forward with uh, some kind of action. We have a lot of knowledge already that uh, we, uh, that, uh, we in our science in our interaction that um, I personally am eager to move uh, on from what is called, we, uh, we call diversity one to diversity two because uh, seeing all these efforts that we are engaged in and seeing how many people are using the dashboard to inform their own departments and to make uh, things work is really exciting to see. So let's challenge ourselves, not only just 
to think differently, but also act differently. We are a system that's dismantled by reinventing ourselves and our institution. And so I will end here with, uh, I like Emily Stiles uh, seeking educational uh, equity and diversity quotes. Uh, it's more about the balancing windows and mirrors. It says education needs to enable the student to look through window print in order to see the realities of others and into mirrors in order to see themselves own reality reflected. So with that, thank you so much. And I welcome any questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Dr. Asiedu. Um, it's really helpful to see how you've your journey, your personal and professional journey, and how you've taken um, get real from crowdsourcing and 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 just gathering data and kind of being like somewhat of a sounding board for your colleagues yeah. to something that's really um, moving the needle with with regards to diversity, equity, and inclusion at in your at your institution, but with uh, so many implications for what we do across systems. So really, thank you for that. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I will jump into some questions that were asked. And for anyone else, uh, if you have questions, please submit it to um, host in the chat to host. And I will read it out loud. So the yes. first question is um, probably much earlier in your presentation, uh, you talked about uh, minorities leaving Mayo Clinic. So, so have the minorities that have come into the Mayo Clinic and left after two to three years identify discrimination or diversity issues as a major reason for them leaving the institution? So um, we, have a, we have a study that has recently been approved. Uh, it was approved by uh, IRB, but we got into some hurdles with HR because there's not much that will be revealed in terms of identities of uh, people, but we're, we're planning to do a post or exit interviews with these people because what we find is when you look at the quantitative data and the several quantitative surveys, all you have is, oh, I have other family needs, uh, I need to take a break, you know, so you can tell that I hate to say there isn't an authentic uh, explanation, but we know we know that there's more to it, except that employees will not document that in their exit interviews. But also when we, and we also know that when there's an outsider from HR, like our department doing these, these, uh, uh, these studies, we've, we've had success with it in the past. And we know that we, if we happen to get these people on board to talk to us, some of these things will, 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 will come up. But when you talk to people outside, uh, of work and those who have left. I personally know a few who have left for different reasons. In fact, uh, to say the least, last year, a, a physician actually committed suicide uh, and that was linked back uh, to uh, some of the stressful uh, experiences regarding racism and discrimination to that. And that sprung up a whole lot of discussion around it. So, but again, it will not be documented as such. So my team and I are really uh, looking into getting those authentic uh, reasons and authentic uh, exit uh, comments from, from this population, so. So do you think a similar format to Get Real might work for that? I think we will have to be strategic about that a little bit because remember they they are leaving they already left and when somebody is leaving out they don't want to have anything to do with the organization so we're thinking more of doing interviews uh, uh, conventional qualitative interviews with them rather than giving them a dashboard um, to to because if it's a dashboard then it has to be we have to set it up in a way that it's only for that group of people and not uh, be available for other. Of course, what we have, the dashboard we have is, is for our in, internal users only, and we could do something like that, but we have to be strategic and think through that uh, uh, carefully and wisely. So another question, um, mm -hmm. 
from the audiences in relation to the business case. How do you get buy-in to DEI projects when the data collected may sometimes be controversial or not pleasant for the organization? Oh, I tell you. So, <laughs> the, <laughs> I don't even know what to start and how to start. It is, I can tell you the reports for the, uh, the reports for the Get Real platform have not been published because of the same reasons. Because mm. there are cases, there are cases, and that there, there are stories that are really detrimental. I will say, but th <sighs> there are some legalities too that are involved. But the thing is, at the end of the day, okay, we when we reported those uh, those uh, findings. We know the leaders were not happy about it, but that's the reality. We kept pushing, we kept making noise. And sometimes you have to find, you, I guess you have to be political about it and find a way to get one person to think with you. And I think we got that support from numerous people. That was what helped us. Otherwise, I don't know how we're going to end. And, and, one thing too, you should know that sometimes those things are really controversial, the results are controversial and it gets into heated argument. But even though they may not say it directly, it also have them thinking and also have them um, kind of put in efforts to make changes, although they may not directly you know, reference what you have. And we've seen that firsthand with our reports. There are now things that have been taken out of the reports and been used in different settings and different scenarios. But of course, we cannot take credit for it because they don't want to reference the report. And that's okay. So far as those issues have been addressed uh, without having those controversial uh, discussions, that's fine, but yeah. They will come. You just have to figure out <laughs> how to get your buy-in and how to, uh, uh, you know. Um, I think there were instances where we used um, actual uh, actual um, employees to stage the stories. So because there were difficult stories, we used the stories of these employees. We built real talks around it. So we will get maybe two or three stories and get the platform. We have a Friday, uh, Friday event called Everybody In. When we get the stage, uh, that stage every month, we'll pick up three or two stories and have conversations about it. So mm -hmm. if one, yeah, if sharing information in one space does not work, try and get multiple spaces to share the same information. The receptions may be different, but they get it, the institution gets it, it's, it's yeah. So you're saying kind of somewhat, you, it sounded like you did somewhat like a fireside chat type of format. Oh yes, a lot of that, a lot of those fireside chats, a lot of uh, departmental presentations, a lot of, um, what was it, uh, grand rounds like this and uh, targeted, um, physicians and groups, um, yeah. So, and, and, and for us, you know, it is not us presenting our story, right? It is us presenting the stories from your organization. So it's not, we did not make this, this up. So, and one thing is, I think when you're presenting those or having those conversations and you create the, uh, you create the, a session that you, you, you're coming to. I mean, people feel threatened, I should say, when you're presenting those information. So you have to, I think in, 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 a, in, in, in I mean, at some point we, ha we changed our rhetoric to be like allyship. And so instead of presenting the stories and it sounding like negative experiences, We've we uh, changed it in a way that we presented as being an ally. Okay, what can you do to be an ally? Are you interested in being an ally? What does it take? Okay, these are the stories or experiences people are having. How can you be an ally to such a person? We actually have some physicians who came who has who have come up with um, some kind of guide 
to help people who as bystanders or to help people who experience those things to get through it in a way that makes sense so that pe people don't feel attacked or in a way. So, I mean, there are different uh, strategies that could be used, but oftentimes those difficult, yes, are very, those conversations are really difficult, but don't quit. <laughs> <laughs> So yes. while we're on the topic of buy-in, my my question had to do with um the scorecard. And mm -hmm. um how do you get so I, I get getting uh upper level administrators to buy into the concept of taking this seriously, but how does this trickle down to like managers and supervisors and what do you see them intrinsically motivated to complete the scorecard or did the administration have to put some, attach some incentives to it? Like how, mm -hmm. how, how are you getting people on board? That is a great, that is, board? yeah, that is a great question. And we actually had someone said something funny on our pharmacy uh, project that, oh, when you talk to them, they are willing to do it, uh, but then you give it to them, you give the toolkit and the scorecard to them and they don't they don't use it. They go back to their old ways. And my question is, were they involved in you creating the toolkits and the scorecard that you did? So we 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 um believe that co-creation of those uh those toolkits and the scorecards are very, very important. Yes, you need the buy-in of the administrative leaders, but the supervisors and managers are also very, very important. For example, we sat on interviews and just observing uh, what was going on in the interview. At the end of the day, we, we put up our reports and it wasn't welcomed nicely, but we sat down with the supervisors and say, hey, this is what we're noticing. How can you help us so that we can make this process? And we found out that co-creating the ideas with them, even though we have our own findings, co-creating the new ideas with them and actually involving them in, 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 in the process was very helpful. And I think most times that's what happened. People feel that they are there and then some things are dumped onto them for them to integrate into their, their work. But, um, if we try to do more of co-creation than actually uh, developing things and pushing it down, I think that that has had some quite good re uh, receptivity from, from our end as well. Yeah, and I guess uh, one other question I have is related specifically to the dashboard. Mm -hmm. And um, I know part of the dashboard is uh, avail is it available only to employees or is it publicly available? It's not publicly available. This is, uh, uh, for now, it is available to some employees, so not all employees. So we're, we're trying to work it out so that we can, it can be available to employees. I don't think it's ever going to be available outside of mm -hmm. Uh, a Mayo Clinic because it's something that we want to use to inform our uh, efforts in this space. So we kind of watch the trend and see what's happening and then we come out uh, other interventions and other things around it. So we may we may share the results afterwards, but not necessarily making it available mm -hmm. to outsiders. But who knows? Yeah, I thought, so when we met at SBM, I think you all were, um, you had just, I guess, just launched the, yeah. the, uh, the, the center. So mm -hmm. there, there was some talk about possibly sharing the platform technology, like to other health centers. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there is that, um, but you know how that, process because you yeah. have to get your copyright whatever they call it and all that mm -hmm. yeah I I I choose not to be involved in those because <laughs> <laughs> it's it always reason. yes it <laughs> always the meetings are tough ones that yeah if you're passionate about what you do you may end up saying okay. something <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's really helpful for us to see our school is uh, starting our campus climate survey soon. So just even getting um, 
an understanding of like your get real project um, mm -hmm. platform and all of that was really helpful to see in terms of mm -hmm. how we're thinking about our qualitative aspect of our work. So this is, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. I appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, so I can, we can probably end soon. I just want to give you one last opportunity if there's anything else you wanted to share or say before we close out. Oh, not necessarily, but you had mentioned a climate assessment. Um, and I, uh, so one thing that I also want to do is we're building this dashboard so that we can incorporate other things that are happening in the institution. So we have, we also built a climate assessment uh, tool within the diversity science and uh, have had some findings from it. And we're trying to see if we can incorporate those findings into the uh, dashboard. So the dashboard is not just dashboard for uh, workforce, but it's also going to incorporate some of the research that we do so people know what we are doing. So I think yeah, we can all learn from it and, and, and do good work. Yes. But thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. Yes. And, really and just relatedly, there's one quick question. Um, yes. <laughs> that's related to the dashboard. Mm -hmm. So in a dream world, we'd have a checklist to build similar dashboards in other institutions. I wonder if a paper is on this, a paper on this is on the way. Someone wants to know if you're writing up. This. Yes. Okay. There is a paper on the way, but it's going to be a long time because we there are some hurdles that we have to, you know, cross with, you know, HR, what, what can we share and what can we not share, especially because it hasn't gone through um, this, a copyright and other stuff things so that we don't want people to copy the idea so yes that's in progress we have a fellow who is working on that um, but once we get through the legalities of it we will get it out there yeah. yeah thank you so much for your time thank you so much Sasha. <laughs> yes yes um, have a good day you, good day to you too oh mm -hmm. adorable <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> I didn't think it was. I'm using two monitors, so I'm trying to navigate. <laughs> Thank you all. all right. Thank Take you.